This needs to be said first and foremost. All views expressed in this video are my own, not necessarily shared with the creators of Digimon Digital Adventures, and this video is definitely not officially sponsored by them, Toei, Bandai, or anyone else with the rights to Digimon or the system at hand. So now that we've covered human character creation, if you haven't seen that part, go watch it first, it's time to get into the real meat of your character creation, Digimon creation. Generally speaking, your Digimon should be the combat-focused half of your pair. Whereas the human provides support with special orders and handles skill checks, Digimon are strong and more combat-capable than their human partners in most cases, particularly when they evolve and get stronger still, though we will be covering evolution in a separate part. So the most complicated thing about Digimon creation is that when you make your Digimon character, you aren't just making one sheet. Instead, you're building every stage that the GM tells you will be usable in the game. Though, personally, I'd recommend just going all the way for a fresh, also known as Baby 1, all the way up to Ultra or Super Ultimate, at the very least. This way, if things get a bit crazy at some point, and your Digimon gets hurt and knocked back down a stage, you'll have a sheet for it. This means that while all of these sheets are technically the same character, their mechanical builds can all be unique, though how unique is up to you, and generally speaking, I wouldn't recommend making them too different from each other because of reasons we'll discuss in the character advancement episode. So, the chart on screen right now details the amount of DP, which is Digimon points, which is the Digimon version of XP, or experience, base movement speed, base wound boxes, base brains, number of attacks they have, base spec values, and the stage bonus value of that stage of evolution. We'll get more into the rest later on, but for now, the most important number is your starting DP. Right, so your starting DP is how much DP you have to purchase stats and qualities, which are special abilities that further define your Digimon, which we'll discuss in a minute, at the start of the game for that stage. For example, you can't use starting DP from your rookie to buy extra stats on your champion. The 25 DP must be used on your rookie, whereas your champion has 40 DP to start with. The document states that most common starting stages are in training and rookie, so ensuring they've got enough stats and the qualities you want to start with if you choose any is super important. You will earn DP when your human earns XP at an equal rate and the expenditures are far simpler and cheaper for Digimon, but we will get to that in the next part. The document also notes that Digimon will outperform humans mechanically, and that's fine. It forces humans to rely on the Digimon for protection, but the Digimon have to rely on their partner for support and the ability to evolve in most cases. Unlike humans, Digimon have stats, which are actually called stats this time, derived stats, spec values, and a stage bonus. They don't have skills of their own per se, and generally use their spec values for making skill checks. There are qualities that let you change this, but we'll touch on those far, far later, and this is going to be a very long video. If you haven't, pause the video right now, go get some popcorn or a snack or something, go use the restroom if you need to, because we're gonna be here a while. For the moment, let's touch on stats. There are five total. Accuracy, damage, dodge, armor, and health. Each has a role in combat, and when combined, they can determine the values of your derived stats. First up is Accuracy. It measures a Digimon's general intelligence, and also controls the effectiveness of negative effects, the Digimon's range values, and how big any area attacks it makes are. The most important two factors, however, are that it helps determine the agility-derived stat, which you use for skill checks, and it's rolled as a pool of d6 dice equal to the value of the accuracy stat when making attacks during combat. Again, we'll touch on dice rolls, dice pools, all of that in the next episode when we talk about mechanics. For now, all you need to know is that a dice pool is basically that many d6 dice. So let's say your Digimon had 11 in their accuracy. When they made an attack, they would roll 11 d6 dice or 11d6. If you want a Digimon who's smart, loves to apply effects for a long duration, or just wants to take advantage of the extra damage that you can get from accuracy, which we'll discuss in the combat section, you want this to be fairly high. In fact, generally most Digimon want this to be pretty high because, well, they're the fighters. It, they don't really do much if they can't fight. Next up is damage. Damage is how hard your Digimon's blows hit their target at their lowest and it affects the body stat. If you want your Digimon to be able to hit like a truck, put points into this. 
but it's also very useful if you want to play a grappler type Digimon since body is the stat rolled for grapple checks and it is derived from damage as well as a couple of other stats we're about to talk about. I would also recommend not dumping this stat. I know how it will seem when we get to the combat section and I explain how accuracy bleed over works. You're going to think, oh, I can just dump damage and I'll be fine. I'll use my accuracy to make up for it. No, do not do this. I've seen someone do this. It does not end well and it ends in you basically doing chip damage for most of the game. Next up is dodge. Dodge is a further measure of your Digimon's nimbleness as it affects agility in tandem with accuracy. But in combat, like accuracy, you roll it as a d6 pool when your Digimon is targeted by an attack to try and avoid that attack. If you want to make a dodge tank, or you know, you just hate being hit, you can put points into dodge. As with the other stats, skewing your stats too much one way can be a bad thing. Sure, having high dodge is good, but because of the nature of the dice, you can roll all 1s, 2s, and 3s, and 4s, and just not succeed on any of them. If you dumped armor, you're gonna get turned into... dust. Well, I guess data, since it's a Digimon. Speaking of which, armor is the next stat, and unlike something like in Dungeons & Dragons, or any sort of d20 system that's similar, armor is a damage reduction, not a two-hit chance. All damage dealt, however, will always be at least one, so even if your armor blocks all the damage, you're still going to take one damage. The reasoning for this, from my understanding, this is not an exact quote, so the disclaimer at the start of the video, is that if you didn't have this, then all you would have to do is pump armor and you would never be hurt. I like this, it's easy, and there are multiple abilities to get through armor anyways, which we'll touch on later in this video. You'll also want this stat not to get too high, because after a certain point, it becomes redundant. Generally speaking, even in the latest of games with like 70 DP, once you hit about 25, 30 armor, you don't really need any more. Most attacks won't do more damage than that on average, and if they do, you're going to be blocking most of it anyways. I've found you can usually get away with about 20 armor and be fine. That said, the higher it is, the higher your body goes, because this also factors into your body stat. If you want to play a grappler, high armor is good. It's also good because while you're clashing, you can't dodge. So having high armor, you're going to take less damage. Finally is health. Health is a stat that also affects body, but has a few other benefits. First among them is that it adds into your base wound boxes, which are your health points. Having high health means that if you have a melee Digimon or a grappler, you're going to be able to stay in the fight longer, since it also affects the body score. You also roll this as a d6 pool to see how long the positive effects applied to you by allies, or enemies I suppose if they don't have selective targeting. You also roll it as a d6 pool after combat to see how many wound boxes you recover. Raising these stats at character creation is super simple. You spend your starting DP on a one-to-one -one basis, meaning that if you put one point into health, you gain one point of health. And how you spend your starting DP on stats can define how your Digimon fights. There are some restrictions. First of all, you must have at least a one in all of your stats. If a quality could reduce a stat to zero, you have to spend the DP to bring it back up to one. You probably don't want to spend all your points on stats. Trust me, some of these qualities are really good and a really great value, and you'll want them. The document itself discusses the pros and cons of stats versus qualities in good depth, so I recommend you read it yourself for more in-detail analysis. Generally speaking, though, you want a good balance leaning in favor of stats, in my opinion. Qualities are cool, and maybe at later stages you can get away with spending a little more on those since they tend to pay back into stats, but early on, especially with rookies and champions, you, you don't want to spend too much on qualities. Again, read the document yourself if you want more detail. I would also recommend that you make sure all of your Digimon at all stages have a similar stat spread at character creation. This means that when you raise your stats with bonus DP, which we'll discuss in the character advancement section video, all the other stats will be raised for your other stages, because you spend the points on your base stage, which we'll also discuss in the evolution section, which will be next video. So stay tuned for that. You won't have to account for any weird deviations from your stat spread that late, and it'll make sure that you don't have to worry about changing up your stat spins later on. Spending 30 on stats and 10 on qualities for a champion or adult level Digimon, I would agree is a good spread. You can find all the examples in the document, so if you want more detail, go check that section out and read the document yourself. This video, as I've said, is going to be very long, and as you've probably noticed, is going to be very long. so. If I go into any more depth here, it would just drag this video out even further. 
and I don't want to do that. Now next up the document covers qualities, but I'm going to jump straight into derived stats which are located at the end of the quality section in a separate section. I feel like they should be grouped together here because a lot of the qualities discuss a lot of these things and so it's important that you know what these are and what they do. So the derived stats are agility, body, and brains. Agility is a simple measure of speed, body of strength, and brains of mind and will. Agility is calculated by taking your accuracy and dodge, adding them together, and dividing by two. Body is damage, armor, and health added together and divided by three, and brains is simply your accuracy divided by two. You round down for each of them, and you add your base brains to the brain stat you get from dividing your accuracy by two. So these three derived stats also in turn feed into your spec value. Spec values are special stats used for effect potency, area tagged attack areas, as well as skill checks. The spec values are RAM, CPU, and BIT, tied respectively to agility, body, and brains. You take the derived stat associated with each and divide it by 10 to get your spec values. You also add your base spec values from your stage of your Digimon to this number. So let's say you want to have a Digimon that specializes in ranged area of effect attack, and while they do that, they also apply effects to those enemies. You're going to want high accuracy, because that's going to lead to a higher bit, because you're going to have a higher brain. Make sense? Good. Moving on. Next, we're going to talk about your attack. Attacks are based on your stage. You have a certain number, and you can't have more, but you can make a basic melee attack, which has the melee and damage tag. Generally speaking, this is reserved for lower stage Digimon, like in training or rookie, because you can only use each attack once per turn. Now, when you make an attack, you have to choose whether it's melee or ranged, and whether it's damage or support. Melee tagged attacks are obvious, they're melee, you have to be adjacent to your enemy to use them. However, there are some qualities that benefit more from melee than they do from ranged. Meanwhile, range tagged attacks use your range to, well, determine how far away you can hit from. We're going to cover it in combat a bit more, but I'll also go over it here in a minute and give you the, at least the base equation. Damage is pretty self-explanatory. It means the attack uses your damage stat to deal damage when it hits something. Support, on the other hand, means that it doesn't deal damage, but you don't have to worry about any sort of weird quirks with effects or anything like that. Now there are a bunch of other tags that we'll get to as we go through the qualities, but for now these are like your basics, these are your base quality tags. And all of your attacks will have one of these, if not more of these. So your base movement is how far your Digimon can move with the movement action, which we'll discuss in the video on combat. It can be modified by some qualities, but that's your total movement rather than your base movement though the book just calls it movement. So moving forward, if I'm discussing base movement, I'll call it base movement. If I'm discussing total movement, I'll call it total movement. Some qualities even let you move as part of an attack or teleport if your Digimon is fast enough, but we'll discuss those in a bit. Your Digimon's jumping height is half of their base movement and height rounded down, while their movement while swimming is also half of their base movement rounded down. So if your Digimon has ranged attacks, then they're going to have range. And it's going to be covered, as I said, in combat a little bit more. But for now, the formula is basically what you're looking at on screen right now. Range is your effective range, which is basically before you start taking any penalties to your ranged attacks. Whereas effective limit is the maximum distance your Digimon can attack from. And basically every two units after your range, you start taking a penalty to accuracy, which again, we'll discuss in the combat section a little more. The last thing you need to know about your Digimon personally is stage bonus. Stage bonus affects a few qualities, as well as when a human hits a Digimon, the Digimon reduces the damage before armor equal to their stage bonus times three. So keep that in mind. Last thing about Digimon that all Digimon have is a size class. Medium tends to be the standard, and usually what humans are, unless they're children, in which case they might be qualified as small. Smaller Digimon tend to gain a little bit of a mobility bonus while suffering penalties to body, while larger Digimon tend to gain bonuses to body while suffering agility penalties. Charts on screen now, so you can see how it affects your Digimon without jumping to the book immediately, but I would recommend you read the book anyways. So you may also see how certain Digimon take up a certain number of square units. Uh, and this can vary a little bit, but their total size must be at least that many total units. For example, a large Digimon, such as a Tyrannomon, could be a 2x2 square. 
Whereas something like a Seedramon, which is more of a snake, might be a 3 by one square and still be large. For simplicity's sake, it helps to just make them squares, but there are some niche cases I can see a 3 by one Digimon being useful. And with that out of the way, it's time to talk qualities. Now what are qualities? Qualities are special abilities that you can purchase to apply to your Digimon or their attacks. They come in three types, Static, Trigger, and Attack. Static qualities are sort of always-on abilities. This means that unless it's somehow shut down, I think the only way to do that really is a boss quality, which we'll talk about in the GM section, and if you're a player, you don't need to worry about that video. But static qualities are basically always going to be active. Trigger qualities have a special set of conditions, or a special condition, that is required for it to be set off. Perhaps it's activated when the Digimon dodges, or maybe the Digimon has to expend one of its simple actions on its next turn to use the ability. Finally, you have attack qualities, and as the name implies, they're used to modify attacks. Usually they only affect one attack, but some affect more, and I'll try to specify which, but if I don't, well, read the book. Trust me, you want to read the book for this section. I did my best to try and cover everything in detail, but I can only do so much. I only have so much room on screen, and I've altered the background for this part of the video to accommodate more text. You're gonna want to read the book. Just trust me. Read the book. These are these are summaries, and you're gonna want to read the book. So some qualities have rank. They mention ranks, or they say they have a rank, or up to X ranks, where X is the maximum number of ranks you could take. In these cases, the quality will generally tell you how many ranks you could take. If it doesn't mention a limit, that means you can take as many as you want. If it doesn't mention ranks at all, that means you can only take one rank of it. Each quality has a DP cost. Some are as cheap as 1 DP, but I think the maximum is 3 DP. For one rank of a quality, mind you. Some rank qualities can cost more with multiple ranks. For instance, a quality that costs 3 per rank and you take 2 ranks will cost you 6 DP. As noted earlier, each stage of evolution has a limited pool of DP to spend at character creation, so spend wisely. The first major category of qualities are the data optimizations. They're static qualities and cost between 1 and 2 DP each. You can only have one of these on any given Digimon stage, so you have to choose based on what you want your Digimon to be able to do. It is a prerequisite for the data specialization and hyperdrive qualities, which we'll talk about in a minute. If any of those interest you when we get there, you're going to want to spend DP on that optimization. First up, close combat. It costs 1 DP and grants a plus two bonus to the accuracy pool of any melee attacks your Digimon has. However, you suffer a minus one penalty to all ranged attack pools your Digimon has. So if your Digimon's a close quarters brawler, this is what you want to go for. Conversely, Rain Striker, while also costing one DP, increases ranged attack pools by two, but if you try and dodge a melee attack, you take a minus one penalty to your dodge pool, and it does stack with any other penalties you've taken. If your Digimon is in the back line and focusing on ranged strikes with ranged weaponry or something of the like, it's not a big deal most of the time, so take this on your back line ranged fighters, your Algumons, and that sort of thing. Guardian costs 1 DP, and grants a plus 2 to your armor stat, which does factor into your derived stats, but the Digimon suffers a minus 1 to its base movement speed. This is good for Digimon meant to be tanky, but not very quick on their feet, and leads to some pretty strong abilities down the line. Brawler costs 2 DP, but you get a huge range of bonuses for the final cost. You get plus 2 to any and all checks while made while clashing, which we'll discuss in the combat section, but it's basically grappling. It's also treated as a size class larger during clashes, which is important, because if you're clashing with a Digimon larger than you, the bigger Digimon gets a bonus of plus 2 for each size it is larger. If your Digimon is gigantic in size, however, they get a flat plus four to all checks while clashing, because they're the biggest they can possibly be. This is best taken on gigantic Digimon who want to play Grappler. Speed Striker is 1 DP, and it makes your base movement score go up by two. This is one of the few qualities that actually directly affects your base movement speed. This is for Digimon who want to move fast, and it pairs well with the speedy quality, which we'll discuss later. Effect Warrior is the last optimization, and it costs 2 DP, but its abilities are very, very powerful. You gain a flat plus 1 bonus to all of your spec values, which for an effect-focused Digimon is very important. But you suffer a minus 2 penalty to armor that does affect the calculation of your derived stats, namely body. For a Digimon who relies heavily on effects in area of effect attacks, this is a really, really good quality to take, even though it's a little expensive for what it is. 
Now, each optimization has a set of two specializations you can choose from, provided you have the prerequisite optimization. You can only take the data specialization qualities if your Digimon is ultimate or higher, and only ultra or higher Digimon can take more than one. They're very powerful abilities, and it makes sense that they're limited. Close combat optimizations are Fistful of Force and Flurry. Fistful of Force makes any area attacks you make with melee attacks scale as if they were ranged attacks. We'll discuss this a little more when we get to area qualities, but for now all you need to know is that this drastically bolsters how far away such attacks can hit. On top of this, whereas most Digimon would get a bonus equal to their RAM value when hit with an area attack that hits other Digimon, this reduces that bonus to half of their RAM rounded down. If you want to level an entire army with a single swing of your sword, this is what you go for. It has the static and attack qualities, and it costs 2 DP. The other, Flurry, lets you make an extra melee damage attack once per round. None of your qualities that aren't static apply to this free attack, so it's a free weaker attack. It's also got the trigger tag on it, and it costs 3 DP. Do this if you want to emulate your favorite JoJo character. Rain Striker optimizations fall into two major categories. Precision with Sniper, and TACTICAL NUKE INCOMING! with Mobile Artillery. Sniper costs 2 DP and has the static and trigger qualities, but lets you use a simple action to enter the sniper stance. We'll discuss normal stances in the combat section, but sniper stance is a special one that removes all penalties to accuracy for ranged attacks while incurring a penalty to dodge against melee equal to the user's ram. Your Digimon can no longer target any enemies within 2 meters of them. A meter is a square cube in this game, by the way. We'll discuss that more in the combat section. You also treat all terrain as difficult in this stance. However, the strongest part of this quality is that if a target has uncatchable target, which we'll discuss shortly, their dodge lowers normally. This means that a Digimon with Sniper is the best counter to a quick moving enemy. As implied by the little sound effect earlier, Mobile Artillery is a powerful ability that costs 3 DP. It's got the static tag, but it lets your Digimon add their CPU value to the any damage dealt by area attacks. This reduces their base movement by 1, but it's a very strong ability on a ranged striker. Next up, Guardian Optimizations. They are What Goes Around and True Guardian. What Goes Around costs 2 DP, and it makes it so that whenever your Digimon is hit with a melee attack, they cause the attacker to take damage equal to the Digimon's CPU with a minimum value of 2, even though it's reduced by armor. It's a static quality, and it's great for any Digimon, such as Philmon, or Stephilmon, or anything with spikes all over it. True Guardian costs 3 DP and is static, but when your Digimon intercedes, which we'll discuss in the combat section, they get a bonus to armor equal to the distance traveled to intercede. If the attack has an area, any allies that are behind the Digimon have the damage they take reduced by the interceding Digimon's CPU doubled, minimum 1 damage dealt, and effects are completely ignored. However, the Digimon suffers a penalty of 2 to accuracy. The Brawler optimizations are a great fit for grapplers. Power Throw costs 2 DP and is a static quality. It lets your Digimon add its CPU times 2 to its accuracy when it throws a Digimon, which we'll discuss more in the clashing section in the combat video. WrestleMania lets your Digimon embrace their inner oh, yeah! by giving them the ability to clash without spending an action once per round. However, the Digimon suffers a minus one penalty to damage, armor, and health, and that does influence your body stat directly. Speed Strikers optimizations are all about going fast. Hit and Run has the attack and trigger tags and costs 2 DP, but when a Digimon uses a charge attack, they get to add their ram to the damage they deal if they hit. However, if you don't move with the charge attack, you don't get the bonus. Uncatchable target is a static quality that costs 3 DP, but you gain a flat plus 3 to your dodge, which does factor into your agility derived stat, and you no longer take any penalties from dodging multiple times per round. If you want to play a dodge tank, this is the one you want. Effect Warrior's optimizations harken back to the days of old JRPGs and like the NES. Both have attack and trigger qualities, Black Mage costs 3 DP, and when you hit with an attack that has a negative effect on it, your Digimon rolls their bit in a D6 pool check, and every success they get does an extra point of damage to any targets hit by the attack as they choose. For example, if you manage to hit 3 targets with an area attack and have 3 successes, you can either deal all the damage to one target, deal 1 damage to all 3, or split it however else you want. 
This damage ignores armor too, which means you can do a little extra damage with a negative effect. You can only activate Black Mage once per round, and no other qualities affect this bit pool check, such as Huge Power or Overkill, which we'll get to later. White Mage is basically Black Mage, but for positive effects. It only costs 2 DP, and instead of dealing damage, it heals a wound box for each success on the bit pool check, split among the targets of your positive effect as you decide. Again, we'll discuss positive effects later, and it has the same limitations as Black so the next major quality tied to these is Hybrid Drive. There's a diagram on the screen, and it's going to be important for this, so pay attention. It costs 3 DP per rank, the maximum of 2 ranks, but you have to have Perfect, also known as Ultimate, or Higher, Data Specialization, a Data Optimization. What this does is it lets you pick a specialization from a different tree adjacent to the one that you have on this chart. So, for example, if you had Close Combat and Flurry, you could buy Uncatchable Target. As the document notes, this quality is generally only worth taking two ranks of at Ultra or Higher due to the ability to get multiple specializations from another tree and the massive DP pool you have at that point. Movement Abilities First up here is Extra Movement. You can have as many of these as you want, but you have to pay the DP cost for each you take, and you may not take one of them twice. Of note, any Digimon of Champion or Adult Stage, same thing, or higher, reduces the cost of their first extra movement rank by 1 DP, meaning that if they take any extra movement other than Flight, they get it for free. Any additional movement types will cost the normal value, however. First up, Digger. Cost 1 DP, lets you move through soft ground equal to the Digimon's movement speed, and it needs to be something like soft dirt, snow, sand, that sort of thing. Ultimately, it would be up to your GM, so rule zero. Next up, Swimmer. It costs 1 DP and lets you move through water at normal movement speed. Flight is 2 DP, but you get the ability to fly through the air, meaning you can now move vertically, diagonally, and horizontally wherever you are. Wall Climber lets you scale vertical surfaces, but not ceilings, with ease. And essentially, you don't have to really make a climbing check or anything. It costs 1 DP. Finally is Jumper. It costs 1 DP, and now your Digimon's jumping height and length are equal to its movement instead of half. So the evolution of extra movement is advanced mobility. All of these qualities are static, and cost 2 DP each. You must have the extra movement quality of the same name to purchase these, with one exception. And that exception is movement advanced mobility quality. It requires one rank of speedy or more, but now you can take speedy ranks, which we'll discuss very soon, equal to triple your Digimon's base movement speed instead of simply double their base movement speed. The advanced mobility for flight means that your Digimon is no longer hindered by harsh winds, and while it's flying, it gets its ram to its movement speed. Advanced mobility digger lets you go through just about any surface, including soft metals, though for soft metals, you have to treat that as difficult terrain. You also get a boost to digging speed equal to your Digimon's ram. Advanced mobility swimmer ignores harsh currents such as rapids and bolsters your Digimon's swim speed by its ram. Wall climber now lets you walk on ceilings, and you are no longer slowed down or can slip off of normal walls. Your Digimon also gains extra movement equal to its ram while on walls or ceilings. Jumper perhaps gains the biggest benefit. You get to add your Digimon's CPU value times 5 to its jump height, and its jump length is increased by its CPU value. These qualities are more ribbon abilities, unless your game is going to have the terrains frequently. So, talk to your GM and only really take them later with bonus DP, which will be detailed in the video on character advancement, since they're very situational. Unless, of course, they fit the flavor of your character, then just go for it. Speedy costs 1 DP per rank, but you can't take more ranks of it than what your movement speed times 2 is. Let's say you have a champion Digimon with 8 movement speed. They could take 4 ranks of speedy maximum, which would double their movement speed to 16, as each rank adds plus 2 movement to your Digimon. With at least 3 ranks of speedy, you can grab Teleport for another 3 DP. This lets you move without actually having to, well, move from unit to unit. You instantly teleport to a unit within line of sight. The distance you can do this, however, is limited to base movement plus 2. This means that, effectively, your speedy movement is sacrificed for the ability to move without actually moving. You can also use this to avoid an attack once per battle, 
though it doesn't trigger counterattack and forfeits a simple action during your Digimon's next turn. Once you take Teleport, for an extra 2 DP you can grab Transporter. This lets you teleport all adjacent allies who are willing using your Teleport. And your Teleport gains plus 2 to its distance. All allies who use the Evasion ability from Teleport also forfeit a simple action during their next turn. So use this wisely and don't piss off your teammates. The next set of qualities are the offensive qualities. First up is arguably one of the best qualities in the game, Armor Piercing. As you can see by the chart on screen, each stage is limited in how many ranks it can take. Each rank also ignores two points of armor when the attack hits, so it's really, really good. You cannot have certain strike and armor or piercing on the same attack without signature move, which we'll talk about much later. It's a pretty cheap quality at 1 DP per rank, too. So, you know, buying a rank doesn't really hurt that bad, and it can do a little extra damage on tougher enemies. You can't have multiple ranks on this multiple attacks, however. If you buy two ranks at perfect, for example, those two ranks both apply to the same attack. This is a common misconception that I've seen several times at my tables, and I'd like to just put it to bed here and now. If you buy multiple ranks of armor piercing, they all go on the same attack. Charge attack costs 1 DP, and you can choose a single melee attack. When you make that attack, you get to take the movement action as part of the attack for absolutely free. Mighty Blow is in 1.2, vanished in 1.3, but now it's back in 1.4. The Digimon that has this quality must be champion stage or higher to take it, and it costs 2 DP. However, if you deal damage after armor equal to the target stage bonus or greater, that target is affected with the stun effect for an entire round. There's no duration beyond this, and it doesn't affect any other Digimon if the attack would have hit multiple Digimon, bar the one you're targeting, and it can only be used on melee attacks. The attack also has an effect, then you have to deal 2 damage on top of the stage bonus in damage beyond armor to apply Mighty Blow. You also can't use Mighty Blow with poison. Certain Strike has two ranks and costs 2 DP per rank. Only Ultimate or Perfect Digimon and Higher can take the second rank of it, and you choose an attack that either lacks armor piercing or also has signature move, and apply the Certain Strike tag to it. For every four dice in your base accuracy pool, without any modifiers such as weapon or close combat or any of that, you get one automatic success. The maximum number of these you can have is tied with your ranks with Certain Strike. With one rank, you can have up to two automatic successes at most. With two ranks, that doubles to four automatic successes at most. You do, however, remove the automatic successes from your accuracy pool, meaning that while you have guaranteed successes, your accuracy pool takes a penalty equal to the amount of guaranteed successes you have. This penalty sticks, even if you change stances or have any other way to modify the accuracy. As stated with armor piercing, you cannot have that and this quality on the same attack without also having signature move. It's a chart on screen now because we're talking about weapon. It costs 1 DP per rank with a maximum of 3 ranks, but your maximum ranks are determined by your stage as per this chart. If you notice the Digizoid access column, we'll talk about Digizoid in its own section. For now, all you need to know is that for each rank of weapon your Digimon has, it gains the ability to apply weapon to an additional attack, and it gains a plus 1 bonus to accuracy and damage for each rank you have. So let's say a champion Digimon has two ranks of weapon. Not only can they tag two of their attacks with weapon, but both of those attacks will gain plus two to accuracy and damage. There is however one other restriction. Your Digimon must be able to justify its use of weapon. There are two ways that the book says you can do this. First is a fighting style that is not the same as other Digimon of its species, such as the Agumon from Digimon Savers. The other type is if the Digimon just has a weapon, such as Bushi Agumon, who has a katana. With higher stages, it becomes a lot easier to justify this, so, for example, Grapple Leomon might be an unarmed fighter, but it has turbines on its wrists and ankles that you could probably justify as weapons to help enhance its punches. The last limitation is that you cannot use the Instinct Tree with this quality. If your Digimon has Instinct at all, it cannot take ranks of weapon, and if your Digimon has any ranks of weapon, it cannot take Instinct. Slayer is a situational quality with a 1 DP cost. You can choose a target type based on its family, Digimon type, or something similar that your GM approves of. Not something like Vaccine, Virus, or Data, that's a little too broad, but something like Nightmare Soldiers, Dragon, Beast, and so on. The Digimon with this quality gains a bonus to accuracy against targets that match the specified type equal to its RAM. 
However, if the Digimon also fits into this specification, it suffers unalterable damage that ignores armor equal to the number of the stages the Digimon with the Slayer quality is above the fresh baby one. For example, Champions take 3 damage. This is a good fluff ability for certain Digimon, such as War Greymon having a bonus against Dragon-type Digimon due to his Draymon killers. Still, you should consult your GM before choosing this. Your choice might end up being a waste of DP, with that one BP being better spent on stats or another quality. Huge power costs 2 DP, and it lets your Digimon reroll any ones in your accuracy pools. Melee attacks can apply this without any limitation, but ranged attacks can only make use of this once per round. Aggressive Flank costs 2 DP, and when your Digimon is within a ranged burst radius of an ally, which we'll figure out once we get to the area effects, or it or an ally are both adjacent to an enemy, the Digimon with this quality gains a bonus to accuracy equal to its RAM value. Overkill is the power-up to huge power. It costs 2 DP, requires huge power, but once per round, a Digimon can reroll 2s on an accuracy roll. You can pair this with huge power, meaning that Digimon can potentially land several successes and do a lot more damage in one hit. Personally, I'd recommend saving both of these for when you use the signature move. Coordinated Assault costs 3 DP, requires aggressive flank, and lets you mark a single target as a simple action. The target suffers minus 3 dodge for every dodge it's already made during a round rather than the usual minus 1 penalty, though this quality can only have one active target at a time. The mark vanishes if the user loses the quality by evolving, or is defeated, which we'll discuss in the video on combat. If the original target is instead defeated, the user can change the target for free. What's more, this quality actually affects uncatchable target and absolute evasion users. If you're sick of that Digimon with agility, avoidance, and absolute evasion getting away from you, Sniper and Coordinated Assault can basically solve that issue. Area attacks cost 2 DP per rank. You must choose a new area type with each rank you take and choose a different attack from the last to apply it to. Hitting multiple foes at once gives all of them a bonus to dodge against the attack equal to their own RAM value. Additionally, some areas are limited to range or melee attacks, while some can be used on either, and if they can be used on either, you don't add any modifiers to the area on melee attacks. The good thing is that if you so choose, you can turn off this quality when you declare an attack, meaning that rather than being an area, it's a single target. However, any qualities that would benefit it as an area do not benefit it as a single target. So the first and probably most common area attack that I've seen is Blast. Blast can only be applied to ranged attacks, but it lets you choose a point within your range and hit every target around that unit on the map in a diameter equal to 3 plus bit in meters. The second is Burst, which is, well, the second most common that I've seen. It can be melee or ranged, and it's a circular zone with the user in the center, and the base radius is 1 meter, though ranged burst gets to add bit plus 1 to the radius. The burst goes outward from the user, so the user can't be hit with effects. Third is close blast. Close blast can be melee or ranged and starts adjacent to the user. It then spreads out in a circular zone with a radius equal to 2 plus bit meters. A cone is melee or ranged, and creates an equilateral triangle or three-dimensional cone which starts adjacent to the user. The shape has a length of 3 plus bit meters. The ending width is equal to its length because it's equilateral. Line areas are melee or ranged and make a pillar that starts adjacent to the user. Its length is 5 plus bit times 2 in meters and its width is 1 plus 1 per size class over large the attacking Digimon is, with large or smaller making this in the value of 0. If it would hit a solid wall, it can bounce off the wall and hit additional targets. Pass is a melee-only area attack, and the user charges in a straight line in the direction of their choice. They hit every target between them and their destination, though they can't change the direction once they choose it. They can move equal to a movement score of their choice they possess, base movement or enhanced movement, or like, you know, flight if they have the advanced mobility flight, that sort of thing and they keep going an additional number of meters equal to or less than their RAM value. Their choice. If you lack charge on the attack, you have to spend both of your simple actions to use a pass attack, but if you do have charge, then you can use a pass attack with a simple action. Next are the counter attack qualities. The main quality of counter attack is, well, counter attack. It costs 2 DP, and once per combat, you can make a free attack if an attacker misses their attack on you. This attack only hits the attacker, and the target rolls half of their dodge pool rounded down in response. One of the upgrades is Counter Blow. It costs 3 DP and requires counterattack. 
You can choose an attack to apply counter to. And when the Digimon uses counter attack quality and chooses the attack with counter on it, the target only gets to apply half of their armor rounded down against that attack. There's also cross counter, which similarly requires counter attack and only costs 3 DP. If the enemy messes you with a melee attack, you can use counter attack once per fight. You have to take the attack that missed you, and not only do you not get to dodge, but you also take an armor penalty equal to your Digimon stage bonus against the attack. You cannot take cross counter if you take the combat monster quality, and cross counter does not trigger counter blow. The upside to this, however, because that all sounds like a bunch of big downsides, is you don't expend your use of counter attack. So you basically get a free second counter attack. Now, stealth qualities. Sometimes you want to be sneaky, and these qualities can help you do it. First up is Hide in Plain Sight. It costs 2 DP, and any character trying to spot the Digimon with Hide in Plain Sight takes a penalty to the roll they make to find them, equal to the Digimon with Hide in Plain Sight's RAM value times 2. How it's flavored is up to you. If you have Hide in Plain Sight, you can purchase Shade Cloak for another 2 DP. You can now apply the effects of Hide in Plain Sight to any allies within your Digimon's ranged burst radius. This is good if you want to hide the whole team. Your other option here is Sneak Attack. It costs 2 DP and requires Hide in Plain Sight, but your Digimon is able to hide from the target thanks to a successful Stealth Agility check versus the target's Perception Brain, and if it does so, it gets a bonus to accuracy and damage equal to its RAM value doubled against the target that failed to detect it. To use this, your Digimon does have to have a means of going unseen or unnoticed, so you can't just make a stealth check right in the line of sight of the guy and get the bonus. Additionally, this quality can only be activated once per combat, or twice if the first round is a surprise round, which we'll get to later. Next step in the Shade Cloak tree costs 2 DP and is called Glamour. You need Shade Cloak, and it lets you change the appearance of you and your allies, though they no longer benefit from the bonuses of Shade Cloak and Hide in Plain Sight. Your Digimon makes a stealth check with a target number of 12 plus their stage bonus, and on success, they disguise allies and themselves as a predetermined way, which you choose when you take this ability. Perhaps your Digimon has the ability to take on a human disguise, such as Arknamon from Digimon Adventure 02, so they can stick close to their tamer in daily life, or perhaps it can disguise its allies as different variants of its Digimon species. If a character cannot maintain their cover with a manipulate check or are physically grabbed by an entity who is questioning their integrity, they lose the illusion. You also can't take this with Illusionary Over. Illusionary Overlay is another branch of Shade Cloak, requiring it and costing 2 DP. And let your Digimon spend a complex action to apply a specified Illusionary effect over a nearby area. You choose what the effect is when the Digimon takes the quality and can't change it later. It can be left in an area to be cover or a distraction, but vanishes if it is attacked, moved through, and this lets the Digimon who made it know when it happens, but the Digimon moving its stage bonus plus one times ten meters away from the point of creation also makes it vanish. You cannot take this quality with Glamour. If you want to focus on Sneak Attack instead, you can embrace your inner ninja with Substitute. You have to have Sneak Attack, and it costs 2 DP, but taking this quality lets you make a Substitute if you would fail a dodge check on an attack. You make a stealth check against the attacker's perception, and if you succeed on the check, you forfeit one-fifth of your Digimon's wound box total rounded down, but do not suffer anything from the attack itself. Furthermore, if the attacker had combat monster damage stored, it automatically gets wasted on the attack. You can only create substitutes up to three times per combat, and the damage you take from it does not count towards combat monster itself. If your Digimon can't afford the wound box cost, they can't use Substitute, and you must have one wound box remaining after the use of the quality to use it in the first place. If you fail the stealth check, however, none of this matters. The attack hits as normal. Next category are defensive qualities, starting with Absolute Evasion. It costs 3 DP per rank, with a maximum of 2 ranks, and each rank you take gives you an automatic dodge success for every four points you have in your dodge stat. The limit on automatic successes is the number of ranks you have in the quality times two, but every time you dodge after the first reduces the number of guaranteed successes by one. You can't take this with uncatchable target. Next up is agility. The base quality costs two DP and lets you reroll any ones on a dodge roll once per round. If you have agility, you can also take avoidance for another two DP. This lets you reroll twos on a dodge check once per round, and you can use it in tandem or separately from agility. Combat Awareness has three ranks with a cost of 1 DP per rank, and the bonuses vary depending on how many ranks you have. The first rank grants you your ranks in Combat Awareness to your initiative roll in the first round of combat. 
If you take two ranks, you gain all the bonuses of the first rank, as well as adding your combat awareness ranks as a bonus to your dodge pool in the first round of combat. With three ranks, you gain both of the above bonuses, as well as adding rank your ranks in combat awareness to your accuracy pools during the first round of combat, and treating surprise rounds as normal rounds. Next up, Combat Monster. This is one of my favorite qualities because there's just so much flavor you can do with it. Combat Monster costs 2 DP. When your Digimon takes damage from an enemy or some specific qualities, it gains a bonus to the damage of the next attack that hits equal to the damage it's taken. This stacks until you hit with an attack. You cannot exceed your Digimon's health stat with this bonus damage, however, and it's lost when an attack with this damage applied hits. There are two separate trees of upgrades you can go for with Combat Monster. First and foremost is Berserker. It costs 2 DP and requires Combat Monster, but your Digimon gains a Rage Meter. It starts at 2d6, which is how you're going to measure this thing, uh, which is also the minimum. So it provides a plus 2 to armor and damage, but you suffer a minus 2 penalty to accuracy and dodge while this is active. You can activate or deactivate Rage as a simple action, and while it's active, it grants the bonuses and penalties equal to your Rage Meter. The Rage Meter increases by plus 1 when the Digimon connects with an attack or is hit with an attack, but is decreased by minus 4 when a round goes by without the Digimon making an attack or being hit with an attack. When the Rage Meter hits maximum, 12, the Digimon loses all control, the GM takes over the control of the character, and a tamer or another ally must use a simple action to pass a TN5 plus range remaining check with their Persuade skill to calm them down. You cannot take this quality with Braveheart. Trust me when I say if you've got the accuracy and dodge to keep going, then it is sometimes worth it. And remember, the minimum you can have is always two. You will never have less than two because it's measured with dice. With Berserker, you can get two more options. The first is Boiling Blood. You can have up to three ranks and it costs one DP per rank. The penalty for rage for not attacking or being attacked is reduced by one per rank, meaning with all three, you only suffer a minus one penalty to your rage meter when you, well, don't attack, get attacked. The next is you won't like me when I'm angry. It costs three DP and doubles your rage meter's starting minimum and maximum values to four and 24 respectively. So you start with four and your maximum can be 24, meaning you can rage longer without losing control, and you start with a better bonus to your damage and armor. If you'd rather Combat Monster feed into something a little more noble, however, you can go for the Braveheart Tree. You can't take it with Berserker, but it only costs 2 DP, and when your Digimon takes Braveheart, they can take the Brave Stance as a simple action when their wound boxes drop to below half of their max. When in Brave Stance, your Digimon can take the Guard action, which is a simple action that increases their armor by 50% rounded down while defending against an attack and giving a penalty to movement equal to the Digimon stage bonus. If your Digimon's wound boxes rise over the halfway point, however, the Brave Stance automatically returns to the Neutral Stance, which we'll discuss in the combat video, but for the purposes of this, it means that their armor and stuff all goes back normal. Aside from being unable to accept the Berserker Tree, you also can't take Gain Force Overwrite or Gain Force Undying Enforce with Braveheart, which we'll discuss in the Gain Force section. If you take Braveheart and your Digimon is ultimate, perfect, or higher, they can spend 2 DP to take one for all. First off, Combat Monster now caps with your wound boxes, not your health stat. Second, if your Digimon intercedes while in Brave Stance and survives, they get the Guts effect. This not only grants a bonus to their combat monster damage count for each ally Digimon within their melee burst radius, other than minions, which we'll discuss in the summoner section, they give all allies within your Digimon's melee burst radius the damage they tanked from the attack they interceded on their next successful attack. So basically, all your allies get a miniature combat monster. So the next type of quality are called boosting qualities. These are generally the ones that let your Digimon perform on more equal footing, or in some cases better than, tamers on skill checks. First up is Improved Derived Stat. Each rank costs 1 DP, and you can have up to 30 ranks, 10 in each derived stat. When you take a rank, choose one derived stat and boost it by 1. All you need to do is take one rank and making to make that stat trained. This means your Digimon now makes a skill check using half of the derived stat rounded down instead of their RAM, CPU, or bit, respectively, for agility, body, and brains. Furthering this is Prodigious Skill. It costs 2 dB per rank, and requires an equal number of ranks in, of the corresponding trained derived stat via improved derived stat to take. So let's say you have two ranks of improved derived stat in body, and one rank in brains. 
you could take a total of three ranks of Protege's skill. So you choose one skill from the Tamer list associated with Agility, Body, or Brains, and now you can use Agility, Body, or Brains in full when rolling skill checks on that specific type of skill check. You choose one skill per rank you have in the derived stat, meaning you need 15 total ranks of improved derived stat and prodigious skill for a whopping 45 DP cost to use your full derived stat for all skill checks. Different Digimon stats are associated with different human stats, since they only have three. So Digimon body is equal to human body, Digimon agility is equal to human agility, and Digimon Brains is equal to a human charisma, intellect, and willpower for the purposes of what the Digimon's derived stats add to which human skill check. If you'd rather focus on improving spec values, you can spend 3 DP per rank for up to 9 ranks, 3 in each spec value, to boost the spec value of your choice by 1 per rank taken of the system boost quality. You can only improve any given spec value up to 3 times with this, however, which means that if you took 3 ranks of bit and then took a 4th rank of system boost, you would have to choose CPU or RAM. This is valuable for Digimon who rely on effects or area attacks, but it's also very costly. So the next quality is a sister to weapon, called Instinct. Rather than bolstering your offensive capabilities, Instinct increases your defensive abilities and mobility. Each rank you take grants a bonus equal to ranks taken in dodge, health, and base movement. As shown on the chart here, your number of ranks, like with weapon, is limited by your stage of evolution. You cannot take Instinct and weapon on the same Digimon. Reach lets you use melee attacks and initiate clashes at a number of units equal to twice the ranks you have in Reach Away. Each rank costs 2 DP, and the maximum you can have is 3 rank. Additionally, melee area attacks can have their point of origin be anywhere within this range. The upcoming list of qualities are all utility qualities, meaning they serve a less combat-focused purpose and are generally situational. I recommend talking to your GM before taking these, as it's their job to give you ways to make use of them. First up is Technician. It costs 1 DP per rank with 3 total ranks, and it automatically gives your Digimon fluency in Digicode, which is also known as Digimoji. On top of this, it's skilled at repairing code and technology, and gains a plus 4 to any skill check that involves deciphering code and machinery or rebuilding things while in the digital world. This bonus increases by 4 per rank taken for a maximum bonus of plus 12. By taking Technician, you can then take Firewall for 2 DP. It gives a bonus equal to your technician bonus in routing out intruders in an electronic system or protecting the code it's working on, while also granting access to three more ranks of technician for purchase, meaning with six ranks of technician, you get a plus 24 bonus to both types of check. Trojan is the inverse of Firewall, but can be taken with it. It costs 2 DP and grants your technician bonus to attempts to get into places that your Digimon really shouldn't, and it helps in invading electronic systems. It also grants another three ranks of Technician available for purchase, meaning with the maximum ranks of Technician you can take with Technician, Firewall, and Trojan, you can have up to nine whole ranks, which is a plus 36 to those checks, which means you'll probably always succeed. I don't think you're ever going to encounter a check that's beyond 36. Well, 39, actually, if you count the base three. Tracker costs 1 DP per rank, with a maximum of 3 ranks, and it grants plus 4 to any Perception Brains check to find hidden traps, enemies in the immediate area, or other such things. It's also good in tracking down a Digimon, and the plus 4 bonus becomes plus 6 if the Digimon is provided with something like an article of clothing or footprints to trail uh, the person you're making the check on with. Tumblr costs 1 DP and reduces fall damage equal to the Digimon's RAM times 2 when it's falling or being thrown. If the Digimon also has Advanced Mobility Jumper, fall damage is completely negated. Nature Walk is a fairly complicated quality, but the first rank you take of it is free, though the second rank costs 1 DP, and you can only have up to two ranks. It's similar to Slayer in that you should speak to your GM before taking it, and choose a type of terrain or element that fits the campaign you'll be playing through with your GM's help and your Digimon. Most of them grant a plus two bonus to something within their specific element, but there are a few other benefits to taking this quality. First up is Fire. Fire gets plus 2 to damage and resistance to hot temperatures while being immune to burn effects. So let's say you're in an area near a volcano. Your Digimon gets plus 2 to damage, resistance to the heat from the volcano area, and it's immune to being burned. Those of the water element can breathe underwater, and with Advanced Mobility Swimmer, they gain plus 2 temporary wound boxes in combat that don't replenish until the next instance of combat as long as they're within their element. Water. Wind gains plus two to dodge in areas of their element, so if you're in an area that's really windy, then, you know, you're gonna get to dodge easier. 
Ice gains resistance to cold temperatures and plus two to armor in the areas of their element. So snowy areas, icy areas, that sort of thing. Thunder gains an additional rank of resistance against paralysis in areas of its element. So if there's like a storm going on. Wood reduces poison's minimum duration to two instead of three while in areas of its element. Earth gets an additional rank of armor piercing as long as the Digimon has advanced movement digger and is in a qualifying area, such as underground. Darkness can see in the dark without any hindrance. Steel gains plus two to movement, and as long as they have advanced movement wall climber or jumper, they get an additional plus two movement in urban environments like cities. Digimon of the Light Domain have an additional rank of resistance against attacks that would apply the blind effect while in their element. Next is the Quick Healer Tree. First up is the titular Quick Healer. Costs one DP, and when you roll your health as a D6 pool after combat to heal, you can reroll any ones. Regenerator requires Quick Healer and has a maximum of three ranks. Each rank costs 1 DP and you gain a guaranteed point of wound box recovery for each rank you have. With both Quick Healer and at least one rank of Regenerator, you can spend 1 DP to take second win. During combat, your Digimon can spend a simple action to make a recovery check, so long as they don't attack during the turn they make it. This roll isn't affected by huge power or overkill, though neither are normal recovery checks, so... Resistant costs 1 TP per rank, the maximum of 3 ranks. Each rank reduces the duration of effects that would be applied to your Digimon by 2 rounds, though the minimum 1 round for most effects and 3 for poison still applies. With 3 ranks of Resistant, you can spend 2 DP to take decisive defenses. Doing so means that Resistant only affects negative effects, so positive effects will always have their full duration on your Digimon. Selective targeting costs 2 DP, and it means that area attacks that apply effects will ignore enemies for positive effects and ignore allies for negative effects. Furthermore, when you target a specific Digimon in a clash, only that target's Digimon CPU is added to armor, not both the target and the Digimon it's clashing with CPU. Crybaby costs 1 DP, and it allows an ally to intercede without taking any actions out of the next round once per combat. Packmaster costs 2 DP and requires Crybaby, but it effectively upgrades Crybaby's effect. As long as the Digimon interceding is an ally, and within the Digimon with Packmaster's stage bonusing units of them, they may, the Digimon ally may intercede without using their actions next round. Attack effects have a variable cost and come in three flavors. Positive, negative, and non-aligned. The list of them is on screen now, along with their costs. What you mainly need to know is positive effects tend to be buffs or healing that are meant to bolster allies. Those allies roll their health as a d6 pool against the user's accuracy to determine duration. Negative effects, on the other hand, are debuffs, and the difference between the attacker's accuracy successes and the defender's dodge successes determines the duration for them. Non-aligned effects work the same as negative effects. Now, we have a lot of effects to go over, and rather than wait until the combat video, I'm going to cover them here, because I think you need to know what each effect does if you're going to put it on your Digimon. If I don't mention a target, and I don't say it has no duration, assume it has a target and has a duration, respectively. Part 1, 1 DP effects. Immobilize is a negative effect that reduces the target's movement by the user's bit times 2 and can lower movement to 0. Fear is a negative effect that reduces the target's accuracy against the user by the user's bit value and ends a clash if the user was clashing with the target and the target can't clash with the user for the duration. Pull is a non-affiliated effect that makes the target move directly towards your Digimon equal to the user's CPU plus stage bonus in meters. It has no duration. Taunt is a negative effect that makes the target suffer a penalty equal to the user's CPU times 2, unless the target of the attack is the Digimon who used the effect. Knockback is a non-aligned effect that pushes the target away from the user in a straight line equal to the user's CPU plus stage bonus. Hitting a wall causes falling damage if it goes over 5 meters, hitting a group of enemies using throwing rules. These will be in the combat video, and it has no duration. Moving on, 2 DP effects. Poison is a negative effect that has a minimum duration of 3 rounds and does damage equal to the target's CPU that ignores armor at the end of each round. Fury is a positive effect that gives the target a bonus to accuracy and damage equal to the user's bit. Swiftness is a positive effect that grants the target bonus to dodge and accuracy equal to the user's bit. Confuse is a negative effect that gives a penalty to accuracy and dodge equal to the target's CPU or bit, whichever is higher. Cleanse is a non-aligned effect that has two sub-effects. It removes other effects based on leftover accuracy dice, removing a number of effects equal to the difference between accuracy and dodge. 
If it has selective targeting, it can either dispel positive effects or purify negative effects, but not both at once on an area attack. It has no duration. Vigilance is a positive effect that gives a bonus to dodge and armor equal to the user's bit for the duration of the effect. Stun is a negative effect that causes the target to lose a simple action each turn for the duration of the effect, and ends a clash if the target was clashing. This simple action is one simple action in general, and not a stacking debuff, meaning the target cannot take a complex action and only has one simple action on its turn, and that applying this effect multiple times will not cause the target to not have any actions on their turn. Haste is a positive effect that gives the target an additional simple action for one round with no duration, and attacks made with haste extra action eat up two simple actions, aka a complex action instead, meaning you can attack and move in the same turn without having charge, but you can't make three attacks in one turn. Distract is a negative effect that reduces the target's dodge and accuracy by the user's bit value. Life Steal is a non-aligned effect that heals the attacker equal to the user's CPU value or the damage dealt, whichever is lower. As a complex action, you can double this effect's potency. It has no duration. Strengthen is a positive effect that gives a bonus to damage and armor equal to the user's bit value for the duration. Exploit is a negative effect that gives a penalty to armor and dodge equal to the user's bit value for the duration. Vigor is a positive effect that gives the target a bonus to their dodge score equal to the user's bit and their movement score equal to the user's bit value times 2 for the duration. Skin is a negative effect that gives a penalty to damage and armor equal to the user's bit. Pacify is a negative effect that gives a penalty to accuracy and damage equal to the user's bit value. Last part, 3 DP effects. Blind is a negative effect that gives an accuracy penalty and a dodge penalty equal to the user's bit value and causes the target to take a penalty equal to their stage bonus on sight-based perception checks for the duration of the effect. Shield is a positive effect that gives the target temporary wound boxes equal to the user's bit value. It can only be used once per round, but making it complex triples the effect. Temporary hit points are removed at the end of combat and if they're lost, do not count towards combat monster. Burn is a negative effect that does one damage to the target for every meter it moves by choice or otherwise, and is reduced by armor like normal damage. However, this damage is taken after the movement is complete, and if the Digimon decides not to move at all, it just takes its stage bonus times 2 in damage at the end of the round instead. Nature Walk Fire Digimon cannot be affected by this, and it does not stack with Poison. The most recently applied effect between Poison and Burn overwrites the older one if both are applied, and you can only apply Burn via damaging moves with a maximum duration of 3 turns. Paralysis is a negative effect that makes the target treat all terrain as difficult terrain and gives a penalty to dodge equal to the user's bit value. If the target was clashing, the clash ends, and if the target was under the effects of Overwrite, which we'll get to in a minute, they do not benefit from Roborite anymore. Regenerate is a positive effect that heals the target equal to the user's bit value at the start of the target's turn, and also grants an additional rank of resistance even if the target didn't have any ranks before. Regenerate does not affect wound boxes from shield or any other sorts of temporary wound boxes, only base wound boxes that your Digimon has as a result of their base wound boxes plus their health stat. Dot is a negative effect that turns the Digimon into a 16-bit sprite of itself, and all its attacks are now basic, meaning they only have melee or ranged and damage tags on them, but gain a bonus to dodge equal to the target's ram. Removes the effect of overwrite, similarly to paralysis. Lag is a really weird one. It's a negative effect that drops the target's initiative number a place is equal to 1d the number of the target's bit score or less. And it must be a complex action, and you can choose to make it less than the, less than one whatever you roll on the 1d bit score. And with that, that's all the effects. I decided that I wanted them here, like I said, makes it easier for you to build your Digimon if you know what the hell the effects do now rather than then. Other stuff you need to know is that effects don't lower derived stats, effects don't stack with themselves. If Digimon uh, has multiple effects on it, it can suffer or benefit from multiple effects as long as they all have different names. And if the Digimon reapplies an effect, that duration, the duration of the infect, effect is increased by the leftover accuracy dice rather than increasing the penalty or, or benefit. Next up are advanced qualities. They generally have prerequisite requirements from the qualities covered thus far and tend to be incredibly powerful. They serve oh, as a way to further specialize your Digimon and might not be the best for all Digimon, and I would not recommend a lot of them for new players. They are fairly complicated, and some of them even had me scratching my head and popping into the Discord asking for help. I want to throw a thanks out to everyone on the TDA Discord who helped me with this, because in turn I'm helping the viewer. So first is Element Master. Now, Element Master 
costs 2 DP and requires Nature Walk. You can only take it once, so if you have multiple ranks of Nature Walk, you have to choose one element from the ones you have from Nature Walk and apply it to Element Master. Your Digimon can manipulate that element to their heart's content so long as it's a natural source and it's not magical, modified, or otherwise stated that you can't use it by the GM. As I mentioned in part two of this series, Rule Zero applies. If the GM says you can't use it, maybe you should go poke around and see if you can figure out why. Another boon to this is that anything within your Digimon's burst radius can be changed difficult terrain or normal terrain as a simple action. If it's difficult, you make it normal. If it's normal, you make it difficult. They can also change the terrain to create structures or trails out of it by moving a number of cubic meters of the element equal to their bit value times three. So if you want to make a little house for your friends to stay in and you're of the metal element and you're in a place with metal, you can make a little metal house. It's probably going to be very cold and uncomfortable to sleep on. But hey, it's shelter. Now once you have Element Master, you can choose a few different domains to control via the domain control quality. The cost varies depending on what you go for, but you need Element Master to take domain control, and you can now imbue any terrain tied to your Element Master element with an effect with a potency equal to your Digimon's bit divided by 2, rounded down unless it states otherwise. Creating elements requires a complex action, and requires a natural source of the element to exist as per the rules for Element Master. However, Modified Terrain now has a lasting duration of the user's stage bonus, and the area is your Digimon's ranged burst radius depending on if you choose Aura Domain or Stationary Domain. Stationary Domains let you effectively affect a fixed space that your Digimon has full control over. If your Digimon leaves the area, the effects go away. Aura effects, on the other hand, are going to follow your Digimon around in a burst radius around it. But if the element isn't present, then the domain disperses. Any effects applied with this quality ignore your Digimon having selective targeting, and only those with Nature Walk or Element Master of that element are unaffected by its effects. The cost for a domain depends on the associated elements as I'm about to describe. First up, Fire and Water. Treacherous Fire is the stationary option, and it costs 1 DP. All terrain is difficult to traverse in the area of effect, and if you dare enter the Elemental Master's burst radius, you suffer the burn effect. The second one, Volatile Element, is the Aura quality and it costs 2 DP. While in the domain, the Element Master is treated as if the targets of their attacks are under the exploit effect, with the penalty being the user's bit divided by 2. This doesn't apply to minions. Next up, Earth and Darkness. The aura ability is Shadow Veil. It costs 1 DP and fear is applied at the beginning of every round while the domain control is active. This penalty to accuracy is the user's bit divided by 2. The stationary effect is Sapping Strength and it costs 2 DP. At the start of the round, the domain controller rolls 1d6 once for the targets up to or equal to their bit. If a roll is 5 or higher, life steal is applied for 1 wound box. This is not affected by huge power over. Wind and Ice have the aura ability Gusty Guardian for 1 DP, and it makes all terrain difficult to traverse within the domain unless the target has advanced flight, and knockback equal to the user's CPU is applied at the start of every round, blowing everyone away from the terrain's origin point. It also has a second aura ability rather than a static ability. Cleansing Mist. It costs 2 DP, but applies cleanse to any Digimon within the domain, and when Digimon enter the domain, and at the start of every round after, and all effect durations are immediately set to 1 including poison. Thunder and Light have the stationary ability Rejuvenating Light, which costs 1 DP and applies regenerate at the start of every round within the area of the domain. It also gets the aura ability Thunder Justice for 2 DP. At the start of the round, the domain controller rolls 1d6 once for targets up to or equal to their bit. If a roll is 5 or higher, Paralysis is applied for the rest of the turn, and a movement speed debuff equal to the same potency as Paralysis is also applied. This is not affected by huge power or overkill. Finally, Wood and Steel get Natural Limitation, a stationary ability, for 1 DP. No minions or other than those the controller makes may exist within this domain. When four minions enter, the controller has to make a contested 1d6 roll against the domain controller. A failure for the controller of the minions sees a single minion being removed and being unable to be resummoned. The other ability is the second stationary one, DG Dimension, for 2 DP. When domain creation is activated, the creator rolls 1d6 and targets up to their bit divided by 2 in targets. All these targets also roll 1d6. If the targets roll lower than the controller, they take the dot effect for one round. They have to try the check again at the start of every round against the initial roll from the controller, becoming immune to the dot effect on a success equal to or greater than the target's initial roll. Adaptive Element requires both Element Master and Domain Control and costs 1 DP. It can only be taken once and lets you apply a different element from within the Domain Control categories and apply it either at Stationary or Aura option using your element of choice. The book has examples for this. Please go look at them. I think one of them is like applying 
win to the fire effect or something like that. Yeah, it, it's mostly flavor. But again, look in the book. It explains it way better. This is a very complicated quality, not recommended for beginners. So the next part... Oh, the next part. I'm not looking forward to it. It is one of the most complex mechanics, in my opinion, in the entire system. And I don't say that lightly after all that bullshit with Element Master and Domain Control. These are the Conjurer and Summoner Trees. So have you ever wanted to ruin your GM's encounter? Have you just... Have you just ever wanted to make one of the most annoying types of characters in any tabletop game? Do you like your combat to get dragged out for another 30, 40 minutes, maybe even an hour, just because for the lulls? Then this quality is for you. Conjurer costs 3 DP and may not be taken with Summoner unless you take Mixed Summoner as well. But you get a Summon Pool equal to your bit value times 3. Each cubic meter of summoned object takes up one point from your Summon Pool. Summoning objects is a complex action. You have to establish just what exactly your Digimon can create when you take the quality, and you cannot change it later, thank god. These objects share a wound box pool equal to the user's bit times 4 split among the total square meters of objects and round it down. Each object has bonus wounds of its own equal to the user's stage bonus that ignores effect warrior. Finally, the objects have armor equal to the user's bit times 2 and have no dodge pool. If you stack the objects on top of each other in a wall or such, you can create a blocking terrain, which will immediately stop any attacks from going through it, though area attacks still easily destroy blocking terrain. You can only summon objects once every other turn, and they must be summoned and created within the user's burst range radius. The alternative to this is Summoner. It costs 3 DP, and as with Conjurer, you may not take it with, well, Conjurer. You gain a summon pool equal to your Digimon's bit value times 3. Each summoned minion takes up to two points from the pool, are medium in size, and are summoned as a complex action. As with Conjurer, you have to establish what exactly your Digimon can create with this quality when you take it and can't change it later. For example, if you say, my Digimon summons a bunch of spiders, well, it can't just summon dogs now, can it? No, no it can't. Summoned minions have a shared pool of wound boxes split among them and rounded down of the user's bit value times three and have extra wounds equal to the user's stage bonus unaffected by effect warrior, but they also have accuracy and damage equal to the user's bit plus user's stage bonus, and armor equal to the user's bit. They don't have a dodge pool of their own, are capable of flying a number of meters equal to the user's brains per round, and cannot suffer or benefit from negative or positive effects other than movement buffs and debuffs and poison. Attacking with minions is a complex action, as is moving, and they can only make melee attacks and only have qualities that would apply to the user of the summoner as a whole, such as close combat. The book itself has a comprehensive list. I will put it on the screen. Here you go. If the summoned minions are destroyed, they can only be resummoned every other turn. When they're initially summoned, they have to be put somewhere within the user's burst range radius. On screen is a table detailing the base stats of the summons and number of summoned minions available. Mix Summoner requires Summoner or Conjurer. Costs 3 DP. Unless you take both, though you treat your bit as one lower for the purpose of calculating your summon pool. Elemental Summoner costs 3 DP. Requires Summoner and basically makes your minions explode on death in a burst ranged radius around them equal to the Digimon's bit. The radius is the same as if the Digimon was using a burst ranged attack, and the minions have to roll accuracy to hit with this explosion. Selective targeting and mobile artillery affect this quality. The book lists further effects, and you can't take this with specialized summoning. Specialized summoning costs 3 DP, requires summoner, and the Digimon must be ultimate, perfect, or higher. The summoning pool has the same size, but this quality lets you summon specialized minions that cost 5 points to bring out. These minions share a health pool and have their own individual values for stats. You can only summon those special minions from this quality once per combat and cannot resummon them when they die. Similarly, you have to tell your GM what tactics your minions will specialize in since you can't take this quality more than one time. Tactic classifications are all exclusive bonuses and cannot be summoned via each other's abilities. You can't take this quality with Elemental Summoner. If you take Mixed Summoner with this quality, you still count your pool as one low for the special summon pool. And with that, it's time to talk tactics. Vanguard Tactics doubles the cost of the minion to 10 points from your summon pool, but they have damage equal to bit times 2, accuracy of bit times 1, and armor of bit plus stage bonus. They can only make melee attacks, but they can be large or huge. 
After it's summoned, it has an innate charge attack to strike whatever the summoner is currently targeting, or a target that is the choice of the summoner without any actions. It can only act once within a round during the summoner's turn. You can only have two vanguard minions at a time, and to do so you have to have at least 20 summoning pool points. Safeguard tactics cost the same as normal minions, but have armor equal to bit times two, with the other stats the same as normal minions. Their damage, however, is only bit. They require a complex action to make attacks. They can be medium or large, and can actually intercede, with each minion doing so, eating a simple action from your Digimon's next round. If all three special minions are on the field, you can negate any attack once per battle at the cost of your entire turn next round, and paralysis being applied for the round on your Digimon using their own bit for penalty calculations. It can, however, shield allies from attacks completely, and your minions take all the damage. You can only do this once per day, or once per session. The paralysis can't be removed other than running its course. You can only have three safeguard minions at most at any given time. Recon tactics are more frail, but you get a few boons to compensate. Their accuracy is bit times two, but armor is only bit. They require a complex action to mobilize and to attack, and they can only be smaller smaller. They can share sight with their master Digimon summoner, and directing them outside of combat is a skill check of 3d6 plus bit minus the number of minions active against the suitable target number to see what your minions can see. You can only have four of these active at once. Now there are some charts that help avoid confusion in the book, and I'll show what I can of them on screen over the next few seconds of chatter on my end. But suffice to say, I find Summoner one of the most daunting qualities in the game, and I would absolutely not recommend it for beginners. But if you absolutely have to, don't just watch this video. Read the book thoroughly, and have a complete and thorough understanding of exactly how summons work before you play a character that can do summoning. Next up is something a little more fun, Mode Change. Mode Change lets you swap your stats around in a fixed pattern or freely with enough qualities and ranks, and it can make a Digimon way more versatile. The base quality is called Mode Change. It has two ranks and each costs one DP. With the first rank, you can swap armor and damage. With the second, you can swap accuracy and dodge. Each one takes a simple action and any derived stats or spec values are completely unchanged. Mode Change X.0 costs two DP per rank and has two ranks. You need mode change as well, and taking one rank lets you choose any two stats to swap with mode change other than health. The second rank lets you swap stats around as you see fit, again other than health, when you take the simple action for mode change. Finally, after the absolute hell that was going over summoner and domain control, we finally get to one of my favorite qualities in the whole game. Signature move. Now why is it my favorite? Because it's just so cool. It lets you pull off a stronger move with a delay, sort of like how in the anime Digimon uses their signature techniques to finish an enemy off. For me, if you couldn't tell, it's more comparable to how common Riders have a finisher move they use at the end of fights, so you can see why I love this. If it wasn't obvious, literally look at my YouTube avatar. Signature move has no requirements, but it costs 3 DP and is itself a requirement if you want armor piercing and certain strike on the same attack, which, if you're gonna do a signature move, why not? So the move you tag signature move with is the Digimon's big guns. It's their finishing move. It's their super special attack that you should absolutely shout the name out of at the table when you use it and describe the attack in great detail. It's the big one meant to the end of the fight. It's a spectacular finish to any battle. And absolutely the move that should reward players with inspiration if they use it with perfect timing to take out a powerful enemy. You have to wait two rounds to use it, meaning that you have to wait until the third round of combat to use it, but when it goes off, that's the moment. That's the moment you see in other games where someone pops off after winning a close fight. It's the moment where your character's theme song kicks in and they save the day for their friends. It's the moment where the animation stops being garbage for a few minutes just to show off the flashy finishing move. It's your spirit bomb, it's your rider kick, it's your United States of Smash, it's your fatality. Enough of my gushing though, we're gonna get into the actual mechanics. So there's two types. First is damage. That means the attack has damage on it. The Digimon gains a bonus equal to the number of attacks it has to accuracy and damage on top of any other qualities the attack has. This can make an attack with certain strike and armor piercing incredibly lethal and really be the cherry on top of an epic fight. Then there's effect type. Instead of bonus to accuracy and damage, it gets plus two to the favored spec value for the effect it's using. This can set up for someone else to use a damaging signature move to devastating effect. Quite frankly, it's incredibly powerful, especially with a few ranks of system boost bit or whatever the effect you're using scales off of. Sadly, there are some limitations. If the attack has hazard, which we will discuss later, poison or revitalize, which we'll also discuss later, you can't use signature move with it. 
You also can't use it with any attack that would be a complex action. To use it again, you have to wait two full rounds. Overall, Signature Move is my favorite part of the Digimon in 1.4. Just hits me in all the right places, man. It, it feels good. It's special. In my opinion, that's how you should treat it. Signature Moves are for when your Digimon takes off the limiters. Next up are Digizoid qualities. So you remember Weapon, right? Of course you do. It's a pretty simple quality, how would you forget it? There's two types of Digizoid quality, Weapon and Armors. Your Digimon must be Ultimate, also known as Perfect, to gain the effects of Digizoid, and even then they can only have Colored Digizoid at Mega Level and beyond. Still, they're incredibly valuable for the benefits they give. Usually they give three or four uh, to a few different, they give two, one or two to a few different stats for a total of three or four for the price of one or two DP, which is a great value. Of course, if you have instinct, you're locked out of these entirely, uh, at least the weapons. We're actually going to cover Digizoid armor first, and the default type is Chrome Digizoid. It costs one DP and grants a flat bonus of plus two to armor and plus one to health. Perfect Digimon can take this, and so can anything higher. Next up is Black Digizoid. It costs 2 DP and gives your Digimon 2 armor, and at the start of each round, they roll 1d6. On a 1 or 2, they get plus 4 armor. On a 3 or 4, they get plus 4 dodge. And on a 5 or 6, they get plus 2 to both. Third is Brown Digizoid. It costs 3 DP. You get plus 2 armor, a single automatic dodge success that stacks with absolute evasion, as well as a bonus to ram on any checks made to avoid and break free from clashes. So it can be really good on a grappler. Next is Blue Digizoid, which costs 3 DP and grants plus 2 armor, plus 2 dodge, plus 4 base movement. The fourth option is Gold Digizoid. It costs 2 DP and gives the same bonuses as Chrome Digizoid, but also lets you deal your CPU times 2 to an attacker if your Digimon is hit with a ranged attack. This damage is reduced by armor as normal but can't be brought below 1. Next up, Obsidian Digizoid. It costs 2 DP and basically is the melee version of Gold Digizoid. The last Digizoid armor is Red Digizoid. It costs 2 DP, grants plus 4 to armor, and plus 2 to health. It should be noted that all the bonuses here are applied directly to your stats, rather than being some sort of bonus, aside from Black Digizoid and its rolled effect. This means that the base bonuses are factored into your derived stats. So weapons also come in Digizoid qualities, but you have to have at least one rank of weapon to take any of these qualities. The default type is Chrome, it can be taken by perfect level Digimon and anything higher, the rest all require Mega. Chrome Digizoid grants a flat plus 2 bonus to accuracy and plus 1 to damage. Next is Black Digizoid, it costs 2 DP and uh, your Digimon gains 2 accuracy and rolls 1d6 at the start of every round. On 1 or 2 they get plus 4 damage for the round, on a 3 or 4 they get plus 4 accuracy for the round, and on a 5 or 6 they get plus 2 damage and accuracy for the round. Third, Brown Digizoid. It costs 3 DP. It gives plus 2 dodge, and weapon attacks get plus 2 damage and plus 2 ranks of reach. Next, Blue Digizoid. It costs 3 DP and grants 2 accuracy, 2 damage, and gives your Digimon a single free automatic success on their weapon attacks. The fourth is Gold Digizoid. It costs 3 DP, it gives plus 1 to damage, plus 4 to accuracy, and also increases the range distance before penalties are taken with ranged attack by 5 meters. Fifth is Obsidian Digizoid. The weapon costs 3 DP and grants plus 2 to accuracy and damage, as well as giving a rank of armor piercing to any attack with weapon, even if the attack already has armor piercing, which means you can potentially have up to 4 ranks of armor piercing on a single attack. Finally, you have Red Digizoid Weapon. It costs 3 DP and it's just a massive plus 6 to damage with weapon attacks. Now. You have to remember that you cannot take Digizoid Weapon with Instinct, you have to have Weapon to take it, and it only applies to any attacks that have the Weapon quality. You can, however, take Digizoid Armor with Instinct. You can only have one type of Digizoid Weapon and one type of Digizoid Armor. For example, you could have Red Digizoid Weapon and Red Digizoid Armor, but not Red Digizoid Weapon and Gold Digizoid Weapon, or Red Digizoid Armor and Gold Digizoid Armor. Speaking of Instinct, we're moving on to the next section, Gain Forces. You have to be at least perfect ultimate to take gain force. And even then, you have to be mega level to take any gain force other than overwrite. As with Digizoid armor and weapons, you can only have one rank of gain force, and you cannot take gain force or instinct if you have weapon or Digizoid weapon. Overwrite costs 1 DP and lets your Digimon activate overwrite as a simple action. Your Digimon takes their CPU in damage that ignores armor every round, but they can't be affected by any effect tag that costs less than 3 DP. What's more, 
This CPU damage does add towards combat monster, meaning an instinct combat monster can be incredibly deadly and basically give themselves free damage. However, if you have Overwrite, you cannot have Braveheart or anything from the Braveheart tree. Overwrite also ends if Dot, Lag, Paralysis, Blind, or Frenzy effects are applied. Frenzy is an NPC specific effect that is meant for GM use and we'll touch on that in the GM video. As a bonus though, Digimon with Overwrite are unaffected by Suppression, which is another boss quality which we'll touch on in the GM section, so long as Overwrite is active and Overwrite ignores Suppression. Undying in Force costs 2 DP and basically makes your Digimon heal faster than they take damage. This is represented as a special shield effect based on their CPU value. For each rank and instinct the Digimon has, they also gain an additional temporary wound box to this count. When taking damage, this special shield value drops to half its original value, rounded down. But at the start of every round, a quarter of the temporary wound boxes rounded down replenish. If you want a hardy Digimon or a tank, this is a really good option. Temporal Enforce is the spicy stuff. So it costs 2 DP, and you get to choose your place in the initiative order after everyone else rolls. You basically get the ability to manipulate time. Once you choose your place in the turn order, you can change it every other turn. Though, if you get affected by lag, this ability gets turned off. You can also make a second use of huge power or overkill your choice once per battle. You do have to choose one, and you can't reuse each once. You do have to have huge power and or overkill to use this part of Temporal Enforce, so do keep that in mind. Omniscient Enforce lets your Digimon see the future rather than control it. It costs 2 DP and lets your Digimon make a prediction called a ready action once per round. It's a free action that your Digimon will take if the prediction comes true. So if your Digimon calls the event correctly, they get to take the action they prepared immediately without any cost as soon as the trigger is met. If the prediction is incorrect, nothing happens. Also, you get to reuse Agility or Avoidance once per battle on top of its normal use in a round provided you possess one or both of the qualities. Follows the same rules as huge power and overkill on temporal enforce. Also, calling the reaction. It, it, it happens as soon as the, rea the thing you predicted happens. So if you say, if this Digimon attacks my friend, my Digimon is going to shoot him with my gun. It just happens immediately. As soon as the, digi if the Digimon attacks, bam, you fire the attack. Digital hazard costs three DP. It slaps the hazard tag on any attack of your choice that meets the requirements. You can't change which attack you have it on later, but when you use that attack, it just deals damage without rolling accuracy or dodge within its burst range radius. Any damage taken from the attack is reduced by armor as normal, and you can't put the hazard tag on any attack with armor piercing, certain strike, or charge attack, or any tag that have secondary effects, since you can't take the weapon with instinct, that's obviously not an option either. You do not gain the benefits of selective targeting and mobile artillery with this, and if the attack has an effect, the minimum damage to apply the effect becomes 4 instead of 2. The last enforce is called Zero Unit. It costs 3 DP, and it gives the Revitalize tag on a single attack of your choice. Targets don't need to roll health against the effect, and how it's used depends on how healthy the target is. If they have wound boxes of any amount, the attack is only a simple action. The user gets to pick any two stats other than health and give the target Digimon a buff and wound box recovery equal to the user's bit, with no duration. It doesn't matter what stats are picked, the target is healed equal to the user's bit value regardless. If the target has zero or negative wound boxes, however, the attack becomes complex and immediately gives the target wound boxes equal to the user's bit. The tamer of that target then rolls a willpower check. On a target number of 18 for standard, 20 for enhanced, or 22 for extreme, the Digimon evolves to its highest stage with the wound boxes recovered from before in wounds. On a failure, the Digimon will reawaken at the rookie stage and is back into the initiative via a roll as normal. It doesn't work on Digi-Eggs, and can only be used once per battle. You can't use Revitalize on an area attack, and you can't use it twice on the same Digimon. If you use its first effect, it can't be used on the same target as its second effect. You can also only use the secondary effect, the complex action, once per combat, no matter how many Digimon with zero unit there are in the party. Next up is Burst Power. It's a special quality that requires GM approval to even take, and it costs 1 DP. You also have to have two ranks of mode change X.0, and the Digimon has to be mega level. So for a brief time, the Digimon can tap into a hidden power within them called Burst Mode. This, if you're familiar with Digimon Savers, is a really cool concept, and I really like this. But it's Kajushi M. Fiat and not appropriate for every game. So ask your GM if you want to take this. So the GM has to approve it, and if they don't, you can't take it. Again, rule zero. When you take this quality, you get to reallocate your Digimon's base stat DP into a new Digimon of the same stage. 
You have to keep the same amount of points in stats and qualities, however. So if you, your Digimon has 50 DP in stats and 20 in qualities, you can spend those 50 DP however you like in a new way on those stats, but you can't move any of them to qualities. You can also make equivalent exchanges of qualities. So for example, if a Digimon had weapon two, they could trade it for instinct two. But you can also switch optimizations and specializations for burst mode if you like, but you must make sure that the quality you trade it in is the same value of the quality you trade out. So you could change close combat for range striker, but not for effect warrior. There are also some bonuses that we'll get to in a minute, but to use them you have to purchase the appropriate quality and also your human has to have some certain stats. You choose the quality from the two available one time and cannot choose another one later, so pick wisely. Vigility was your tamer's highest stat. The partner's burst mode gains plus five to damage and accuracy as well as plus five to movement. The first bonus is called the future is now. When taken, the Digimon gets to buy a second rank of Digizold weaponry, provided they already have one. It cannot be the same as the first, but it can open a wide, open a wide variety of playstyles. However, there are some limitations. The rules are as follows. One attack must have the first type of Digizold weaponry you purchased on the Digimon. The other attack must have the weapon that you took with this quality. If you have all three ranks of weapon, the last attack gets both tags of its signature move. Otherwise, you have to pick an attack type. The other bonus quality is called Boiling Power. If your Digimon has Charge Attack, they get a point of damage for each space move to attack with a maximum equal to the Tamer's agility. This bonus does stack with Hit and Run, and can be used with Pass, but turns the attack into a complex action regardless of the normal way Pass and Charge interact. Tamer's highest stat is instead Body, the Digimon gains plus 5 armor, accuracy, and plus 5 temporary wound boxes when they enter Burst Mode. The first bonus quality is called One Vision. The Digimon gains an instance of Reflect with an Intercede action. If the Digimon would take an attack that does exactly half of their wound box total or more in damage, they can reflect half of the damage back at the attacker. This stacks with what goes around and Gold Digizoid or Obsidian Digizoid armor, depending on if the attack is ranged in melee, obviously. It also stacks with one for all. The second bonus quality is the Biggest Dreamer. It lets your Digimon take a second rank of Digizoid armor, though it must be different from one they already have. With high charisma, the Digimon's burst mode grants them plus 5 accuracy and dodge. The first bonus quality they can choose is Butterfly Effect, and oh boy! So, the Digimon basically gets the ability to force a do-over of previous turns that have been taken consecutive to theirs. The limit is the number of turns of burst mode your Digimon has left, because each redo of a turn consumes a round. But effectively, your Digimon travels through time and changes how events play out. So this needs an example, and I, I feel like it does. Like, because this, this confused me to the point where I had to go on the Discord and ask them how this worked, because I was not sure. But this is how it goes. Let's say, Shine Greymon Burst Mode uses Butterfly Effect, with two turns left on his Burst Mode. Since his ally, Rosemon Burst Mode, and Dukemon, an enemy, went right before him in that order, meaning it went Rosemon, Dukemon, Shine Greymon, Rosemon redoes her turn first, undoing any effects from her turn or Dukemon's turn. Then Dukemon goes next and does his after. Then Shy Greymon go ticks over, reverts back to normal Shine Greymon from Burst Mode, and then the turn ticks over to the next guy. You can time travel in this game, and that's why it requires GM permission. Thanks to, uh, again, to everyone on the Discord who was willing to help me with this, uh, because this is a really confusing ability, and I wanted to make sure I described it fairly clearly, and I hope I did. You can always opt for the second option, though, Be My Light. You choose one ally, and any effects with the positive tag given by your Digimon to that ally going forward have a potency of bit times two. Every positive effect that is given by your Digimon only lasts a single round, but they don't have to roll for any sort of duration. But you can't reapply that effect to the ally. Your Digimon also cannot pick itself for this quality's target either. If your human has the biggest of brains and intelligence is their highest stat, your Digimon gains plus 5 to dodge and damage, and has an additional plus 5 to all of its range values. Hey guys, Future Smug here. Popped into the Discord, asked about this after I'd already recorded it, while I was editing. Turns out, the bonus applied is doubling the radius or area of effect of your area of effect attack that you choose with this quality. The bonus can be applied to Hazard, though it makes the attack a complex action. The other bonus quality is Beat Hit. It gives your Digimon a second signature move use. 
That's right, you get a second signature move tag to apply to any move you want. And lastly, we have Willpower. If your human's willpower is their highest stat, your Digimon gets plus 5 to damage and armor. The first bonus is Endless Tail. If your Digimon would be rendered to zero wound boxes, they simply return to Mega Level from Burst Mode and get 10 wound boxes back. If the Digimon has second wind, they can also roll a recovery check for free as soon as Burst Power ends. The other option is those who inherit Courage. If the Digimon would hit zero wound boxes in Burst Mode, they give all allies plus five wound boxes and a bonus to damage and armor equal to your Digimon's CPU. Your Digimon is taken out of the fight, however, and cannot be brought back even with the Revitalize effect from zero. Now you can only use Burst Power once per session or in character day, and it can't be activated until the third out of combat, sort of like a signature move. Once it runs out, you can't use it again until the next session of play. It's ultimately an end game quality that should be bought with bonus DP rather than base DP in my opinion. And I'd argue it's meant to be a mechanical reflection of the Digimon and Tamer's narrative journey. The book suggests locking burst power behind a narrative moment that could make or break a character if you think the target numbers are too easy or too hard. And I think that's just a better way in general, like with the rest of the evolutions. The GM is also encouraged to pull out all the stops on a burst mode fight, and I think you should go for it. Make it a hell of a fight for the player, and give them a big old spotlight moment where they kick a lot of ass. There are a few more qualities left, but these are all either free or negative, and they're pretty simple. So your Digimon can only take a single free quality at any given stage, and the GM can outright disallow these if you want, so speak to your GM. They're generally just meant to add more flavor though, so I don't see the problem. First free quality is called a job well done. At the start of combat, your Digimon rolls 1d6. On a 6, they get a bonus of temporary wound boxes equal to their stage bonus for the duration of the fight. And these will stack with any other qualities or effects that grant moon, uh, temporary wound boxes. On a 3 to 5, nothing happens. On a 2, the Digimon suffers a penalty to armor equal to their stage bonus for the rest of the fight, even if they Digivolve. And on a 1, the Digimon suffers a fixed penalty to their highest stat equal to their stage bonus and immediately takes that much damage as well. This applies for the rest of the battle and remains even if the Digimon evolves. In my opinion, ammo is best used if you're going to give the human characters weapons of some kind. Like, if you're a GM, right, and you're, you're going to let your players cast gun, their gun has the ammo quality. Give them a five-shot revolver, bam, done. So what ammo does is it lets you put the ammo tag on any attack as long as that attack also has three or more other attack tags. So basically, a melee damage armor-piercing attack could have ammo, but a melee damage attack could not. When applied, it lets you use the move consecutive times in the same round meaning you can use the same attack twice per round, which is not normal. But once you run out of ammo, a total of five uses per fight, the Digimon can no longer use that attack during the fight. You can't apply this move to an attack with signature move. Fragile equipment requires weapon or an armor increasing quality, but it can be applied to either or both. If it's an attack with weapon, the Digimon rolls 1d6 when it hits with a weapon attack. On a one, the weapon breaks and the weapon tag attacks cannot be used for the rest of the battle. If you roll a 6, however, the attack gains the Digimon's stage bonus into damage. If you instead choose to go for armor with Fragile, when you roll 1d6, you do it when you get hit with an attack rather than hitting with one. On a 1, your Digimon no longer benefits from any qualities that improve its armor stat for the rest of the battle. On a 6, they gain their stage bonus and an armor against the attack that hits them. Now, inconsistent size is a fun quality and can lead to some interesting situations. When a Digimon evolves, you roll 1d6. On a 1 and 2, the Digimon is medium. On a 3 and 4, it's large. On a 5 and 6, it's huge. It stays this way until the end of combat, and they devolve. You cannot change this size. Violent Overwrite is a gamble, but it's a fun one. At the start of every round, roll 1d6. On a 1, your Digimon takes their stage bonus plus 1 in damage that ignores armor. On a 6, however, they recover wound boxes equal to their stage bonus. Merciful mode, oh god, why is this here try was a mistake, makes all of your Digimon's attacks non-lethal by default. If you want to kill an enemy, you have to declare lethal intent, and your Digimon loses access to offensive stance, which we'll discuss in the combat video. Positive reinforcement makes your Digimon a big crybaby. It has a mood meter that you measure with 1d6, starting at 3. If your Digimon lands an attack or dodges, it gets plus 1 mood. If it's hit with an attack or misses 1, it gets minus one mood. With a mood of three and four, your Digimon doesn't have any bonuses or penalties. With five or six, they get plus one to dodge and damage for every point over four. With one or two, however, they suffer minus one accuracy and armor for every point below three. If your Digimon's mood ever drops to one, the Tamer can use a complex action to boost it back up to four. 
Mind over matter makes your Digimon suffer minus one to all their stats. In exchange, they pick any two skills from a single attribute category on the tamer side of things other than the agility attribute. And these are treated as if the Digimon has prodigious skill for free when they roll those skill checks. It's potentially very powerful, and honestly, a minus one penalty to all stats isn't that bad, especially on higher stages. So, you know, if your GM allows it, go for it. Justice is blind makes your Digimon blind or otherwise unable to see. They have prodigious skill perception towards sound checks and any checks made challenging hide in plain sight. They automatically fail any check based on vision. In combat, they have close blast attached to melee attacks and cone attached to range attacks for free. They can have multiple instances of these two area tags on their attacks, but they can't buy any other area tag qualities. They can't use selective targeting either, and if they make a single target attack, Digimon's Tamer must make a complex direct action. It can't be bolstered, and it applies the usual accuracy bonus, and it's representative of the Tamer basically telling their blind buddy where to shoot. Last bit, negative qualities. In other systems, you have uh, flaws, which are a downside, but also give you bonus points to spend, and negative qualities are similar to this. They give a downside to your Digimon, but they give you extra DP to compensate. Fresh and in-training Digimon cannot have any of these. Rookies can have one, Champions get two, Ultimates slash Perfects get three, Megas get four, Ultras get five, and anything higher gets plus one on top of the Ultra amount. You don't have to take negative qualities, but these numbers are a limit on how many you can take. First is Bulky. Uh, for each rank you take, up to three ranks, you get plus one DP, and it lowers base movement by three. If taking another rank of Bulky would reduce your movement to one or less, you can't take that rank or any further ranks. Vulnerable grants plus two DP and makes the duration of any negative effects your Digimon gets hit by go up by one round while also lowering the duration of positive effects by one round. Disobedient grants one DP and reduces the potency of Tamer Directs from the Digimon's own Tamer by two. Rebellious Stage requires Disobedient and offers another mi another plus one DP. Because your Digimon's goals don't always align with your own when everything goes belly up, you have to roll 1d6 once per round during combat. On a 1, the Digimon won't listen to the Tamer and has to make a Charisma check of 12 for Standard, 14 for Enhanced, or 16 for Extreme. If the Tamer passes, they get a simple action and their Digimon moves as normal. If they fail, the Digimon's next action is complex. Full action grants a full plus 3 DP and requires signature move. Digimon's signature move is now a complex action, and you apply the full action tag to the move with signature move attached to it. Light hit requires armor piercing, and you can take one rank of light hit for each rank of armor piercing you have for a total of three bonus DP with three ranks of armor piercing. You have to have at least your ranks of light hit over your target's dodge successes in order to make armor piercing apply. Klutz requires selective targeting and provides plus 2 DP. When a Digimon uses an area attack, you roll 1d6. On a 5 or 6, the attack works normally. On 3 or 4, the Digimon ignores selective targeting entirely. On a 1 or 2, not only do damaging attacks only hit allies, but negative effects are only applied to them, as well as positive effects being only applied to enemies. Klutz ignores selective targeting and all of its effects. Overwhelming provides plus 2 DP per rank, with a maximum of 2 ranks if you have both the required qualities, huge power and overkill. With one rank, you need huge power, and it always rolls huge power on the first attack your Digimon makes. On the second, the Digimon has to re-roll any fives and take the second result. Rank two requires overkill, and the Digimon's first attack will always activate both huge power and overkill, but the second will force a re-roll of all successes on the attack, both fives and sixes, with the second result being taken out of those re-rolls. You can only apply this negative quality to any attacks with the damage tag. Broadside provides plus 2 DP per rank and is effectively the agility and avoidance version of Underwhelming. The Crease Derived strat has a maximum of 5 ranks and requires an equal amount of ranks in Improved Derived stat to take. The trick here is that you can't take the penalty it grants, minus 1 per rank, to any derived stat you boosted with Improved Derived stat. And uh, also, each rank provides a plus 1 DP. With that, we're finally done with looking at Digimon character creation. As I said in the previous video, once I finish all the parts, I will be hosting a live stream where I build a character live, and then I'll re-upload that to YouTube. The character will be both human and Digimon, so it will be a practical, hands-on guide on how to make a Digimon and a human character, if these videos aren't quite enough for you. This video is incredibly long, and making the script took me two days of work, 
So I'd really appreciate it if you'd like the video and subscribe to the channel. Maybe follow me on Twitter and Twitch. Twitter, I uh, use to update people on what, what's going on with my streams and videos. So if you follow me there, you'll know. You'll also know when videos go live. You'll know where the playlist is. You'll have an access to any updates. On Twitch, I usually stream Tuesdays and Thursdays from about 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. U.S. Central Time, UTC minus 6. Either way, thanks for sticking around through this whole video, and I'll see you next week when we take a look at general game mechanics, evolution, and character advancement.